Good morning. I should say good afternoon to many of you. So nice to see you here this afternoon. We're starting just a couple of minutes after we had a couple of technical difficulties today, but I think we are now on track. So I am very, very excited to have you here with us um, with Director Martin Keller from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So welcome everyone. I have just a couple of introductory slides to talk a little bit about the Scott Institute and some of our other upcoming programming. And then we will move right into our distinguished lecture. So let me move right into that. So first, a quick note in the case that you wanna get in touch with us. I'm Anna Siefkin. I'm the Executive Director for the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon. Very nice to have you here today. There's a couple of ways that you can connect with me here, but I also wanna let you know that you can connect with the Scott Institute. So the best way to hear about this program and other programs that we offer is through signing up for our newsletter. And you can do that from our website, which is www.cmu.edu forward slash energy. So who is the Scott Institute? So we serve as the hub on Carnegie Mellon's campus for the more than 170 faculty members who are working on energy. We also have partnerships that we do strategic research and we love to do programming that includes exceptional speakers like our guest today. So speaking of that, we have a couple of lectures that are coming up in the coming month. I should say through the end of the semester for those of you who are students. So Richard Vorberg, who is the president of North America, the North American hub of Siemens Energy is speaking on Tuesday, November 2nd. Catherine Hamilton, many of you might know her from the Energy Gang is speaking on November 9th at 11 a.m. with a heavy policy focus, very interested in that one. Sushi Talahi is speaking on November 16th. Um, and the good news and interesting part about this is that she is a CMU alumna. So extremely excited about hearing this perspective, particularly with her close ties to another national lab that's near us, the National Energy Technology Laboratory. We are partnering with the Tepper School of Business for an event on November 19th, which is a Friday from one until 2.30 p.m. So please join us. That registration again is on the front page of our website. You can find information there. And then finally, to round out the semester, on Thursday, December the 2nd at 11 a.m., we actually have Breakthrough Energy Ventures, Matt Eagers, Paul Straub from Wireframe Ventures, and Lily Ber Bernicker, who is from the Collaborative Fund, talking about startups and thinking about innovation. So a great way for us to round out the semester. So a quick note, though, on a new program that was just announced, I think last week, it's called the Energy Tech University Prize. So this is um, a National Energy Renewable National Renewable Energy Laboratory project with the Office of Technology Transitions um, to bring forward a new university prize for students. So there's a lot of detail here um, in terms of what would qualify you and your team, your innovation to be a part of this, but wanted to put a few things up there because this is open to undergraduates and graduate level students. And the good news is that this is going to be, the finals are gonna be at Carnegie Mellon. So we're extremely excited about that. On March 24th of next year, you'll be able to witness the finals. So all of these teams coming together in one place, uh, you can see those winners. So looking forward to that. So there's more information about that. Um, and I believe you can Google Energy Tech uh, University Prize to get those details. So related to our being a power connector, again, another thing that we're doing with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is as a power connector, um, providing opportunities for you to match if you have expertise or a company you all can match together uh, through this new tool that's been launched. So I wanted to provide you with information about that as well. And so without further ado, I want to introduce our distinguished guest today, Martin Keller. So I'm going to unshare slides so that you can share slides, Dr. Keller, as I have your introduction. So Martin Keller has served as the director for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and president of the Alliance for Sustainable Energy, the company that operates NREL for the U.S. Department of Energy, since 2015. So under his leadership, a number of full-time employees, the number of full-time employees at NREL has increased by more than 32%. He's a visionary leader who's committed to people, teams, and partnership, which we certainly appreciate. 
He innovatively and pragmatically applies private sector best practices at NREL to achieve game-changing scientific outcomes. So working collaboratively with his leadership team, Martin developed a strategy for NREL focused on three key initiatives, integrated energy pathways, circular economy, and electrons to molecules. The strategy drives advanced scientific research programs, projects, and partnerships at NREL. For example, NREL's partnership portfolio, which includes Eaton Corporation, Wells Fargo, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and New York Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA, and more than 900 private and public sector organizations has generated over a billion dollars of research and development for the lab. So from 2006 to 2015, Martin led energy, biological, and environmental research programs at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. His efforts culminated in being promoted to serve as Associate Laboratory Director for Energy and Environmental Sciences Directorate during his last six years at ORNL. So earlier in his career, Martin dedicated work in a variety of research management positions at Diversa Corporation Enhanced and developed the microbiology expertise of this biotech company. So he received his PhD in microbiology from the University of Regensburg in Germany. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Martin. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Keller. We're so excited to have you here. And I believe that you should be able to share your screen. Yeah. I'm actually Thank you so, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sharing my screen. Let me just yes. go to full. So, and then I can do this. So I hope you can see now the full screen of uh, the introductory slide. So. Uh, That's correct. Th Thank you. And one note before you start, we will be accepting questions towards the end. Please put those in the Q&A. Thanks. Yeah, and again, I hope I hope a lot of a lot of questions from all of you because look, I, I want to make this really as a dialogue. And uh, let me say first, thank you for for having me today. It's a uh, it's an amazing time. I tell you, I'm I'm super super excited, and hopefully this will be clear when we talk about uh, pass to zero net carbon. Uh, there is a lot of activities, as as you may already heard in the introduction, not only at, at Carnegie Mellon but all over the place, all over the United States, and frankly also globally. And of course, we all excited on I'm soon be on my way to, to Glasgow, where we have a couple of very interesting announcements also with, with the with the, the Biden administration. So a lot of things are happening, I think a very exciting times. So with this, let me dive into this. Let me all start you all with a very quick uh, overview of, uh, of our energy. And when you look back and see how in the human history, we always used type of energy. And uh, when you look Go back. I mean, 200,000 BC. We know that that fire was the first type of energy, and it goes all the way down to windmill electricity. I mean, 1888 to you know uh, big wind farms were auctioned 1980. And when you when you look at this, even silicon solar cells were really discovered 1954. So and right now we're seeing a huge change. And now the key is how can we accelerate clean energy to really save our planet, to keep our, our temperature in, in, in check. So a lot of work, a lot of research needs to be done on the next kind of energy, which we need to really have our, our way of life. And, and that's where a little bit what we wanna focus on, on this talk today and, and give you a little bit of an overview there. Before we go into this, let me start with the so-called megatrends. You probably all have heard about this when, when, uh, when you look at this, what's happening in our planet. And again, this is really focused on our planet and there's just a couple of them. It's not all of them, but just a couple of them to get, get started on. So we all heard about cyber threats. I mean, as you know, Carnegie Mellon, a big, uh, also computing school. I mean, there is probably a lot of research also going on and two campuses about uh, how do we keep cybersecurity, cyber threats in, in check. Electrification, we're seeing this all over the place. We electrify more and more, we have to. Resource competition in food and water, population growth, economic development and urbanization, just to mention a few of them. So what does this actually mean? Population growth, you all probably know 9.6 billion people uh, in, in 2050. So uh, our earth is, is just exploding. Uh, we will have need more than two times the resources our planet will provide. So we really systematically have to rethink the way actually we are using our resources on our planet. And population will be the biggest driver and the biggest problem for us to come in respect also to our resources and especially also to energy. Food and water. 
many, many millions of people right now on our planet don't have access to clear, clear, clean drinking water. We also see through climate change, you know, you probably all follow this on the news right now that uh, we have torrential rainfalls right now on, on the West Coast. We have uh, the Northern on, on the East Coast. Um, so the rain patterns will change. At the same, we're seeing increased drought around the globe. We're still using a lot of water for irrigation to grow our food. Um, food is a big problem. You might also know this when you ask people, what is the average age of a farmer in the United States? And people will tell it's about 60. And then you ask, what is the average uh, age of a farmer in Africa? And it's also 60. So we have an aging farming population. Uh, young people really around the globe do not want to do farming. Where do they go? Well, they go into the cities. So we will have a major, major issue on food and water and the resources aligned with this too. And we have to, uh, to overcome these issues and, and figure this out. Urbanization, what I mentioned already. So uh, more and more people move into the city. By 2050, over 50 or 60% of the population will be in big cities. Every week, 1.4 million people move into a city. Uh, globally, as you'll be seeing more and more of these mega cities. The key is how do we provide food and resources and energy to the cities. There also will be a lot of kind of new kind of innovation happening inside the cities. And the key is how do we keep our cities livable? How do we keep the resources into the city? And how do we provide all the resources for, for the cities of the future? Big, big problem in the future to come. And then there's mobility. So not long ago, well, it's 110 plus years, we had horse carriages and you saw this on, on see this on these two pictures on the right here. And um, the transition from horse carriages to the automobile in New York City, for example, took place in about 20 years. So where this was a rapidly new way where we moved from horse carriages to, to the car. And now the big new transformation is ahead of us, which is the electrification of transportation in combination with autonomous driving of our vehicle. This will be another huge revolution in transportation, which is not only impacting the way we're traveling around, but has a significant impact on our jobs for the future, because millions of people here in the US are really related to transportation by driving cabs and Ubers and Lyfts, by transport transporting goods from A to B and so on, and all the way down to our lawyers and the body shops, which repair cars. So this will have a major impact on, on jobs creation and, and the jobs of the future by this new wave of electrification in combination with kind of autonomous driving. So very quickly about National Lab System. So some of you, and again, this, this is an advertisement for all of you who, who are getting ready and then jumping in and doing something after you, you graduate from, from your organizations. A look at the national lab system. There are 17 national labs all over the United States. Again, we are the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We're in Golden, Colorado, on the foothill of the Rocky Mountains. But there are 17 national labs. And again, you mentioned NETL, which I think is also very close to Carnegie Mellon. And I know that there's a lot of collaboration between you and NETL. But this is an interesting interesting career path and a lot of uh, students uh, honestly even don't know about the national lab system so if you're interested in check it out go to DOE or go to the different national labs there's a lot of great opportunities to really advance and do science in this area when you look at that NREL so we're doing a lot of work in renewable power, solar, wind, water, geothermal, a lot of work in transportation from bioenergy to vehicle technology to hydrogen, energy efficiency in buildings and manufacturing, and more and more work around the energy systems integration. How does all this is coming together from solar to wind to geothermal to electric storage to transportation to building efficiencies? How do you tie, <clears throat> how do you link all this together? That's why this energy systems integration will be a very, very important element for the next couple of years. And I also will show you a couple of our facilities and what we're doing in this, in this area to really bring this puzzle together, how the energy systems of the future will work and operate. So when you look at the annual at a glance, so we are about a little bit over 3,000 people. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of students and postdocs and undergrad students. So we, over the last couple of years, really expanded on postdocs and students and undergrads, because I think this is critical. You keep us all on, on our toes. It brings a new kind of excitement to the campus. That's why I love to have students around. And we have a lot of internships also in the summer. 
this is so if you're interested in there check this out this is what, what, what keeps me going you know to work with, with the next generation of scientists because you all you will solve the problems of our globe so we that's why we need you all to continue to work on these big problems to make and create a better planet and we at NREL we always say we're working on NREL because we are serious we want to create a better planet we want to create the future energy systems for our planet without destroying our planet so we have, again, what I said, a lot of work with industry, and we also will talk about this. And why is this important? Because science is the beginning. It's awesome to have great fundamental science in, in nature and science papers and doing all this. But then how to bring technology into the marketplace, how to bring these great innovations through science into the market. And that's why we're working and doing a lot of collaboration with industry, because at the end, a lot of times industry is deploying the technology into the market. That's why it is so important for us to have these collaborations. So before I go into, into more of the details about uh, the, the, the new initiatives, what uh, you know, what you also have heard about our strategic plan, I just want to give you a quick run through through some of the big kind of uh, renewable technologies, because you might have heard this from some people who say, well, you know, wind and solar is now uh, cheaper. We have grid parity. Are we done with the research? So can, can we just walk away from this research and be done with and work, focus on other things? Just want to show you a couple of examples that even on things like solar and wind, there's a lot of work, a lot of innovation we still have to do. So for example, in solar, there is a lot of work we need to do on, on how we integrating large amount of solar into our power grid. How do we improve the efficiency, the lifetime, the manufacturability of PV materials? How do we work on the next generation of solar materials? And some of you might have heard this, what we call perovskites. So this is this new material which you might envision to create solar panels, the way we're making newspapers, that if this very thin ink which you bring onto uh, by roll to roll onto a kind of um, matrix, it can be a flexible membrane, as example, or it can be a piece of glass, it can be a piece of concrete. We are putting this on there, and with this, you would have solar everywhere. You would significantly decrease the cost of uh, current solar panels, even much cheaper than we are already right now. And this is, again, the biggest, I think, biggest new solar materials, which can be a game changer. There's a lot of fundamental research we still have to work on, like the efficiency is increase, increasing significantly. So the next big challenge is stability. How to bring these thin films onto, onto the carrier. A lot of real innovations needs to go on there. But if we as a research community break through these barriers, this can be the next cheapest way of producing electricity. The same is true for wind. There is a lot of wind you know, development. And again, uh, following the, the 2035 Biden goal to have uh, clean electricity by 2035, uh, we will need much more wind. So we need to work on how do we make uh, uh, wind even more integrated into our grids? How do we make it more kind of uh, scalable? How do we make it more resilient? How do we do work offshore wind? I mean, floating platforms, that's where wind was on land. Um, so on, on offshore, we still behind where we need to go in comparison to where we're onshore, but offshore wind will be very, very important to figure this out. You know, we have the, a different situation as you see in Europe, where a lot of the offshore wind is actually just like in a, I would call it almost like a bigger lake. So where they can use the current technology, our, our land, our coastlines flow down and get very deep, very, very quickly. So this is why we need floating platforms. We need to do a lot of innovation research in offshore wind here in the United States. But there even there is new materials. Can we even create larger wind turbines right now? To, we cannot on land make them larger because we cannot transport the wind turbines to, to the site. So it's the new materials, it's the new ways of manufacturing to make them on site directly where the wind plants will be. So there is even there a lot of innovation still happening in this area. Hydrogen. And fuel cells, you probably all saw this. I mean, the, the Biden administration launched this Earthshot on hydrogen, which the goal is to create one kilogram of hydrogen for $1 in, in one decade. So the one, one, one goal, very ambitious. So with this hydrogen will be a, a kind of platform molecules where we can use hydrogen, not only in transportation, but also to create new materials in energy storage and so on. And we will come back to this one in one of our big initiatives. So hydrogen is uh, taking a lot of attention right now. And uh, I'm super excited to see where we as a nation go and also on a global scale and the opportunities hydrogen will create for a long-term energy system. 
And then again, what has started out is the energy systems integration. So we have a whole facility around this. So where we're bringing all this together from renewable electricity to vehicle to grid integration, renewable fuels to grid, energy water, high performance computing, analytics and visualization. So in short, how do you link all this together and how do you envision and develop a deployment plan to create the energy systems of the future? And then what I said earlier, energy security and resilience. You probably all seen the big events we had also, I mean, this year from Texas to some uh, hurricanes, through some drought, through some flooding, we're seeing that resilience of our energy systems will gain more and more uh, of importance. And this also links straight back to the security on cybersecurity. And we will talk about this, how the grid of the future will look like. This will create a lot of entry points for other people who want to do bad things on our grid. So this is why cybersecurity will be a major effort for the grid of the future, even more than it is right now, how we protect the energy system, the architecture of the future, and we will come back to this one later. There's a new facility we have in, in Alaska. This is the Arctic Cold Climate Research Facility. So this uh, folks up there in, here in, in Alaska working with a lot of tribal communities and uh, communities uh, on the forefront, on the tip of the spear on climate change, on the building side, how do we create kind of buildings of the future for these people who are really impacted by the climate change. And a lot of work goes on there, which we can learn from these communities and bring this down here to the lower 40s to, to uh, at lower 50s to see how we can actually build and integrate this new building technology with the next energy technologies of the future. So now with this, we quickly showed you a couple of uh, big, big highlights, but now let's look a little bit into the future. Where do we go and how does this impact our research agenda for the future? So we've done this, what we call environmental scan. And a lot of this will be very obvious, but where we ask from in reliance, you know, within our, in our research uh, staff to uh, guest speakers, to a lot of people who we've invited to see where do we go? And this is a couple of the strengths, which we felt were very important to then inform our research agenda and the strategy for the next 30, 40 years to come. So first of all, the growth of energy use in the developing world will by far outpace growth anywhere else. Well, you probably have seen this in many areas in, in, on the world. I mean, let's say in India, for example, uh, or in Africa, large cities are still dark. There's no, no electricity in, in, our, in their homes, in their houses. So they will catch up and we will need to provide energy and electricity for this piece of the world. And we, the key is how do we do this right? Global renewable power demand will grow. I mean, renewable power, this train left the station. This will grow rapidly across the world. It, in many areas, it is meanwhile the cheapest way of producing electricity, and this demand will grow significantly over the years. Urbanization trends will dominate new infrastructure growth. We talked about this, that people move into the cities. So this will give opportunities to develop new kind of infrastructure inside the cities. And a lot of new innovations will go, will be developed within the cities and then we're spread out into more rural communities. Electrification, electric vehicle adoption will grow strongly. You have seen this over the last five years. Uh, a lot of the OEMs made this decision now to stop combustion engines. Why? Because electric cars will be cheaper than combustion cars. And this will come very, very quickly. Demand for high density liquid fuel on the other side was, will also grow. This is for uh, air traffic, for uh, marine uh, you know, ships, heavy duty cargoes, uh, we will need more hydrocarbons. The question is how can we make them in a sustainable way without pumping them out of our ground? And then there's the three Ds, digitalization, data, decentralization, will be the strong drivers for the energy transition. So this would be very, very important and will happen. And then the power grid evolutions are increasing the attack surface. Again, that's basically what I told you about cybersecurity. So this kind of trends led us into our three big initiatives. And I will talk about this into more details, but they are, they are integrated energy pathways. So this is basically how do you link all this together? And we will talk about this, electrons to molecules. How can you take electricity? Now where electricity will become the cheapest form of, of, of energy. And how can we make molecules, materials, and hydrocarbons of this? And then there's the circular economy for energy materials. So this is basically how can we change it that right now we're taking minerals out of our, of our soil, 
we're making our devices and we put them onto landfill. We need to do better to recycle our materials and bring them back into the economy. But also what I wanna point out there is what you see in the middle. So that's the heart, not only for Enrol, but I think it's also the heart, I would argue the same for Carnegie Mellon, for every other organization is the people, the team the scientists, the researchers, everybody who keeps their organizations going. That's why we put this by definition in the middle. So how do you create the work environment for the future? Uh, we all learned through COVID that we all look at this, we all work differently and a lot of this is now virtually. So how do we create the best work environment that we can attract worldwide the best people that they come to our organizations and stay with our organizations because we need the brightest talents to overcome the challenges I, I, I we talked about earlier on this presentation. So integrated energy pathways, I mean, this is the develop of foundational knowledge and technologies to optimize the integration of renewables, buildings, energy storage, and transportation. Again, what I said, how do you tie all this together? What is the energy pathways of the future? Electrons to molecules, conversation of electricity and small waste gases like CO2, or hydrogen, or N2 into chemical bonds for the purpose of chemical material or fuel synthesis or energy storage. So how can you go from electrons through some of the space gases to carbon-carbon bonds and to new materials down the road? And again, circular economy, we talked about this, bringing the materials back into our, into our economy. So let's go into the integrated energy pathways, why this is so important. So cost of renewables have fall or falling too rapidly. You probably all seen this. The cost is coming down. Now with utility scale solar is at $37, wind is at 40. So even now the latest numbers even go further down. Here in Colorado, Excel published some of the power, uh, power purchasing agreements. So where wind now is uh, down at 21 dollars a megawatt hour. This includes four hours of storage. This is project where we will be deployed 23. Utility scale solar also with four hour of storage built in is a $36 megawatt hour. So you're seeing that renewables right now in many areas here in the US, but also globally are the cheapest form of producing electricity. And you're seeing this that coal is about $112. And even a gas combined cycle is at 59 right now, as you're seeing with the big spike in, in, in natural gas. So this is even goes, goes up, it's getting more expensive. So then people say, well, you know, uh, renewables destroyed uh, the, the coal industry. And honestly, this is not the case. You're seeing this here, that the biggest increase we've seen over the last years was on natural gas, gas where a lot of coal plants just shut down or also shifting over to use natural gas. So now what we are seeing right now is now, in contrast now is that the renewables are really increasing rapidly and getting deployed at a much faster pace right now, as we have seen over the last five years. And when you look at this in 2020, renewable energy production was about 21% of electricity generation in the United States. And we're seeing that this trend continues, that more and more deployment will be on renewables. So this curve will go up rapidly. So now at the same time, you're seeing that the grid is changing. Historically, the grid was going into one very simple direction, which is still this gray on this, on, this, uh, on this slide here. We had bulk power generations, we had transmission distribution from there, it went straight to the consumer or prosumer and they used electricity. And now it's getting very, very complicated as you can see on the slide. So the grid edge is where a lot of the action is happening, where our houses become much smarter. So we have smart meters, smart water heaters, energy storage, thermostats getting smart. Uh, we have electric vehicle in front of our door. We have a battery in our garage. So the grid will be bi-directional. We produce and generate electricity, which we might sell to our neighbor. We have very, very different ways of producing electricity from wind farms to solar plant to hydrogen plant as storage, geothermal plants, big energy storage is all over there. And in addition to all this, we seeing a telecommunication and interconnections overlaid the grid architecture because with all the smart devices, we need the communication that these devices can communicate. So you can see that the grid of the future will be completely different. It will be driven by power electronics, which will be many, many more millions of points where we can control the grid. But it also will increase the danger that people using, let's say a, sm a smart uh, meter or water heater to control and get access to, to our grid. And with this cybersecurity will increase on importance. But this is where it will happen. This will happen independent 
of you know, more wind and solar. This is also what a lot of the consumers want. They want to have smart water heaters. They want to see what is the energy demand on the homes. They want to have batteries. They want to have solar panels. So a lot of this is naturally changing where the utilities have to adapt to this new way of, of the grid of the future. So this will then lead what we call to autonomous energy systems. Because now with all these new developments, what I showed you, with all this overlaying, with all these millions of devices, so we need to have the grid of the future, and not only in grid, it's the same for transportation, where millions of cars will communicate with each other. The same for buildings, where we have smart buildings, which are connecting and talking to each other into a whole city. We need new ways to control of this. And this is will be done by machine learning, by artificial intelligence, by new ways of computing uh, systems. We, we need to work on no non-linear non control systems. We need to work on optimization. We need to learn how to deal with this complex systems. And we need to learn to deal with this big data analytics. And this has to be done not only in just minutes or, or, or hours, it has to be done in seconds to integrate all this together. Big challenge, I think, for, for new algorithms, for new math, for new computing, a lot of work will go in there in this, what we call autonomous systems, how we're we linking all this together. And this shows you another description of the future energy systems, you know, how it's all will work. Because again, you see it all the green arrows, by definition, bi-directional, very complicated. Um, it will integrate all types of energy systems to be more complex, distributed and interdependent. So you have islands, islands going on, microgrids going on. It will still be connected through a grid. So this is where the challenge for the energy systems will lay for the next years to develop the system and starting to implement them. And then the question is, how do you run this? And again, this will be what we've done here at Enel over the last couple of years, and is that this might be done in a very hierarchical system, that we will have a, a numerous power electronics devices at all levels. So you can see this, that we are estimating that on the transmission level, we are dealing with the hundreds of millions of devices, which we then control into almost like this kind of, a, kind of custom kind of areas, which then will be hierarchical built together. So this again, brand new way, how we're controlling the grid of the future. Right now the grid is controlled, the Eastern grid, for example, is con controlled with 10,000 control points. Some of the models and simulation, uh, we're estimating that alone the Bay area might have about to 10 million controllable points. So completely different way of running the grid of the future. So then how do you do this? How do you then start to implement this? And again, this is where the systems integration comes to place. And then this is where we need facilities actually to do that. One of the facilities we have, which goes up to two megawatt, is our energy systems integration facility or ESIF. But two megawatt is great. You can do a lot of research on there, but that's not big enough to really have one step before we then roll it out into the real kind of uh, environments. And that's why we're developing ARIES. So this is the Advanced Research and Integrated Energy Systems. So this now goes up to 20 megawatts. So this is again, by definition, a size which is behind kind of the uh, regular kind of uh, distribution, you know, after transformation station. So that's why we picked 20 megawatts. And this will have energy storage, power electronics, hybrid systems. You have the future energy infrastructure, you have cybersecurity, you have all this life devices on wind turbines and solar panels and battery storage and electrolyzers and ultra fast chargers, where we can tap into all of these life devices and we bring them into a virtual emulation environment. This means that we virtually have a kind of power system and we're tapping and having live equipment at this facility, which is piped into the kind of modeling systems, which will help us to really not just do models, but we also can really evaluate the output of this by having live equipment in the loop. And this will be a world unique facility up at, 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 at our uh, original wind site close to Boulder, because we're bringing all these different elements together to go to 20 megawatts, working with a lot of utilities and other industries where they can bring in equipment, validate the equipment, where we can do a lot of cybersecurity as a kind of cyber range in the same way. And then from there, you, you can validate your system and then launch this into the real environment. This is now my pitch to all of you because we need to speed up the process of bringing technology to scale. 
It took about 30 years from the solar panels to be really become the cheapest form of electricity. We do not have 30 years. We have roughly about 10 years to meet the 2050 clean energy challenge. So we need to, ex we need to expedite the scale up of technologies. So we need to be faster in from the laboratory through scale up into the economy. So we only have 10 years to develop the next type of technology, scale it and be ready to deploy this at a very large scale. This is a daunting task. This is a big, big challenge ahead of us. This is why we need all people. We need the brightest people across the US, but also on the, on the scope, on the globe to work together to overcome these big challenges for us. I'll give you another example why working with industry is so important. So we had this very long partnership with First Solar. You might know this, First Solar is now the US largest uh, solar manufacturer in the United States, they're in Ohio. So they're doing uh, kind of this Catherine Telluride, which again was developed at Enroll. So we worked with them from the beginning. And just lately, we had this paper where we showed them that with a new doping of a new material into the Catherine Telluride solar cells, we could exceed the 20% efficiency. It's more stable for a longer time. So we worked with First Solar, took this fundamental science, scaled very quickly, and it's now in the new manufacturing facility, which they just finished up in, in Ohio. So this is the process. We need to go fast from the research through scalability to get this into the economy. Now let's talk about electrons to molecules quickly. So why is this important? When we go and having much more deployment of renewables in the very near future, we might have surplus, we might have overproduction for many, many days if the sun shines or the wind blows for electricity. What else can we do with electricity? So right now, if you have a wind plant provider or if you run a wind turbine and you have, and the, basically simplifying all this, the grid is full, you cannot put more electrons in there, guess what? You have to turn off your wind machines. So what if, if you take this electricity and combining this with CO2 molecules, and capture and concentrate this? And can we then use through conversion technologies with biocatalysis, electrocatalysis, hybrid electrobiocatalysis? Can we then make fuels, chemicals, materials in storage? Very likely this will go through hydrogen. This is why I think hydrogen is such an important platform molecule for us. But if we can figure this out right now to take electricity with kind of waste gases to make fuel, chemicals, and materials, then we are of much further step towards creating a sustainable energy system. Because we, again, what I said earlier, we need hydrocarbons, we need materials, but the key is, can we make them from a different starting material as raw crude oil? So that's what's so exciting about this. Yes, we can do this right now, but right now it's still too expensive. We have to decrease the cost by at least a uh, uh, a log, perhaps a little bit more. So, but it's possible. So we have technology to do this, but we need better catalysts. We need more, more specific catalysts to do this. And if we would uh, break through this, it would accelerate us to a very, very new dimension. This is now taking off across the whole world. I mean, Germany has a program they call Power to Fuel, Power to X, same concept. Japan is working on this one, again, using hydrogen as an intermediate. So this is something we need as a planet. We need to figure out how we can make hydrocarbons and materials in a more sustainable way. And this brings me to circular economy of energy materials. So right now, again, we're doing this linear approach. We take it, we make it, we dispose it. And right now, that's not sustainable. Again, what I said, with our growth in populations, we need to find better ways to bring the materials back. And the key is we need to bring the, the kind of recycling on the reuse of the materials into early stage of the design of the individual uh, components. Give you the example of lithium batteries. We always worked, we, all of us worked very, very hard to develop lithium batteries for automotive, for transportation, which were highest density with the smallest footprint, but then, of course, we really said, oh, we need to get these materials back. So this is, again, where we need to bring the reuse of the materials in the design element at an earlier stage to know how we can recoup all the materials, the minerals going into these different devices. This is for solar cells. This is for wind turbines. This is for batteries. This is for all energy technologies that we find a way to not putting this very kind of precious kind of resources back onto our landfills. This is the same for plastics, for, for upcycling, for plastic components. We don't want to throw them into the oceans. How can we bring and bring these materials back into our economy? 
That brings me to polymer upcycling. Like we have a bottle consortium where we're working on two kind of new ways. First of all, can we bring plastics back and can you make something which is even at a higher value than the original plastic bottle? But also can, could we create new kind of polymers, plastic polymers, which are easier to be broken down and being recycled in a way which is easier naturally, but also in, in, in uh, recycling uh, plants. Right now, plastic is not very well recycled. It's a complicated process. You just creating a, um, a material which has a lower value as the original bottle because it's not working very well. Look, this is why our aluminum cans are not floating in our oceans because we know how to recycle aluminum, but we don't know how to do this on plastics. So in the last couple of minutes, I wanna just quickly talk about partnering for impact. Because what I said, we have a lot of partnerships across the whole kind of chain. Uh, we have 900 active partnership with industry, academia and government. We feel that this is absolutely critical to get this technology into the marketplace. And we need to do even better because we need to be faster in scaling this technology up. Just here to mention a couple of them, we're working with people from the defense industry, from federal side, internationally, state and local, manufacturing, foundations, chemical industry, and power sector. So we have partnerships all across the whole industrial portfolio. That's critical because again, what I said, faster to get into the market. Just to mention a few of them. So one of them is LA100, and I will talk about this in more detail, what this was. We have a very exciting project with Dallas Fort Worth. So this is a deep partnership with the airport there to see what is, how can you electrify an airport? How will consumer and, and, and people who travel come to the airport? How do we bring goods to the airport? What will play, what will electric planes play for commuter traffic in airports? A lot of work is going on in the electrification of airports and transportation hubs. Eaton Corporation is a great uh, collaboration. They are on our site. So we have 20 people now at Eaton embedded into, into our facilities. We're working hand in hand with them on new way of electrifying certain elements from transportation to our homes. And in Wells Fargo is an incubator where we're working across a lot of startup companies, bring them to our site, help to mature this technology. Then they go out and Wells Fargo is the first customer to deploy this technology into the marketplace. This brings me to another very, very important element, which is energy justice in, in how we're doing this, that we bring everybody around in this energy transition. We cannot leave communities behind. So we need to bring, for example, coal communities, oil and gas communities, <clears throat> kind of uh, low income communities on their housing. So how do we can bring them all together to accelerate the energy transition and not leaving areas within the United States behind? One of this is a really interesting project, and this now brings it back to Alaska with our cover, uh, our center up there, is where this people, our folks worked with kind of a couple of the tribal communities there, where they lost a lot of the elderly people because the homes were not suitable for them. Uh, they had to build new homes because of climate change. You know, they they see erosion on on the coastlines with the sea ice disappearing permafrost is changing. So we worked with them to develop this new concept of a house, which basically is that the inner of the house, which is the kitchen and all the kind of uh, uh, bathroom is developed in a container, which is easily shipped to these communities. And then we train the local communities to build the houses, the homes around this type of container, really custom built for their needs, how they live in their homes with multiple generations together to custom design the homes with the local community to create jobs in these communities to build these homes. This was a tremendous success. And this is one of these examples that we need to do a better job as scientists and engineers to work with local communities, to bring them along on this journey in the energy transition. The LA100 was another big example there, where this was a study which we published now probably a year ago, which was when LA came to us and said, what can we do to achieve 100% renewable energy for LA? So we worked very, very hard in creating a deployment and implementation plan. So yes, it is possible to create 100% renewable energy. We also know what the cost is for doing that. And we now modeled every home, every house, every rooftop, put solar panels on there. We, we modeled every kind of electric charging station for future transportation. We modeled every site where it can put wind. We completely developed um, a deployment plan to reach this 100% renewable energy. This said, we have done this 
with the communities, LA communities in mind and be through a lot of interaction with the communities, help them to bring these communities along into this to create this an energy trust transition for LA. This is now scaled through the Biden administration across many different uh, kind of communities across the United States. So we need to create a system where all communities can get this help to see what is their path to a clean energy transition. How can you do this with the energy justice in mind? So this would be a major undertaking, but I think we need to do this for the US. We need to be on the forefront of this. And again, the key is we cannot leave anybody behind in this transition. But first, I wanna stop here. I wanna thank you for your uh, attention. And I hope that you all have a lot of questions in the time remaining that we have a little bit of a dialogue. So thank you so much for your, all your attention. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, I think if you unshare, if you stop sharing. Yes, perfect. Okay. Great. So we do have quite a few questions that are coming in. Thank you so much uh, for your comments. I'm particularly interested in the, the, the justice part of the conversation that you had towards the end. Obviously the technologies are critically important to all of us and scaling, um, getting to um, these, these bigger audacious goals is very important. So quite a few questions come, are coming in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of send them over as we can and we'll keep going until, um, you know, just for a few more minutes, just so we can get as many of these as possible. So we have a question that's come in that says, please share your perspective of energy storage systems, both residential and grid, as well as the work NREL is doing in this area. Yeah, so look, uh, storage, especially if you go to high penetration of a renewable storage would play a major role. And I think storage falls into different categories. I mean, there is there a lot of times right now when we're talking about this also in our homes is that let's say, well, we can put a, uh, um, solar panels on the rooftops and we have some, some, some uh, batteries uh, aligned, uh, which also helps you know, on, the, on the transportation side. So this will happen very, very rapidly that uh, you provide storage in your homes, let's say to four to eight hours roughly. So, but then, then we also need long-term storage. And this is again, which is DOE also in, in, initiated one of this new kind of uh, earth shots, which is a long, term to very long kind of storage uh, technologies. And this will be interesting to see what will be used for this. It will be probably not lithium batteries. It will be perhaps different flow cell batteries. It can be other technologies. I mean, from, from actually even down the road to perhaps even use hydrogen in, in kind of uh, in flow cells. It can be that this is um, even the uh, uh, kind of uh, de uh, decarbonized natural gas, because as you know, our pipeline system is a great way of storing. So the technology which will win at the end, it's not clear. I also will predict that it will not be one technology. It will be kind of a plethora of different technologies, which we will deploy from, let's say, midterm, which it might be, let's say, a couple of days to real long-term storage, which could be hydrogen in, in salt caverns. So it will be interesting what, what we will develop, but it's clearly that we need to get a storage and a control and we need to do a lot of innovation in the space. Thank you. Questions continue to come in. Um, can you please tell us what the current lifetime of top perovskite solar cells on glass and plastic is from your research? Yeah, so look, this is this is. I mean, we always say when when our scientists put this together, and then you having this in a, in a in a kind of a laboratory setting, uh, is where we are. And look, there, this uh, cells are stable for a long time. But honestly, this is not what the real experiment is. The experiment is that you have to bring this out into the community, and that's again what we're working with, a couple of startup companies in this area, but also with our scientists to really, and this is happening as we speak, that you build the film thin film, you put the sandwich this into a glass plates or you, you, uh, you capture this, you seal it for the environment and then you have to bring it into the environment to do the real experiment. And that's frankly is missing right now. Uh, this is important also for uh, kind of bankability of some of these technologies. So I don't wanna give you right now a, a, a kind of a, a, a half-life. Uh, this is under development and especially in the laboratory, it's very, very promising. When you look at this, the success, uh, and I think I showed one of the diagrams how the stability really increased significantly over the last two or three years. But again, that was a requirement, but now you have to bring it into the life experiment out in the field to really do the real life test. That's what's happening right now. Next question. 
how much of a change in the transmission network is going on and would be required in, in the future to integrate the distributed energy resources in the grid? How big of a challenge is this right now? Uh, again, it depends because it depends on the region. Uh, look right now, it's a very interesting discussion because certain regions, for example, one of, one of the extremes is in California where, where they, some people argue with the distributed systems, we don't need a kind of an increased distribution network. We can do this with the current system and then doing a much more distributed, almost like uh, microgrid systems which are connected. So this is one side. The other side is that we definitely need to build a transmission system, especially when you increase wind significantly in the, in, in the, in the, in the Midwest, for example, or in, in the, how do you bring the electricity Electricity to our coastlines where a lot of our people live. So um, this is a big discussion right now. I tell you, my personal opinion is we need to have a national kind of uh, uh, transmission plan. So I think we need to increase the transmission lines. Uh, we need to do a better job in bringing the, the electricity from the center of our countries to the coastlines. Um, the problem there is also how do you build them? I mean, it's there's a lot of controls and a lot of kind of uh, regulatory issues and nobody wants to have a transmission line in the backyard. That's an issue we have to overcome, but I think I think we need to do this. So we need to have probably a mixture between distributed systems, but also an expansion in our transmission line. So we are right now with, with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, we're working for DOE on a, a kind of a national transmission plan. So this is going on right now with a lot of also other players in this area. So I hope we can in the next six to nine months can show you more of this study uh, how this could look like, but I would predict that yes, we need to, to invest into a better transmission system. Thank you. So we have a question and interesting uh, that you're going to COP26. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing those announcements. With the recent uh, UN report on the status of climate change, how has it changed your views on achieving decarbonization by 2050? And do you think it's too ambitious? What obstacles do you foresee interfering with this goal? So I'm looking at that's an excellent question. And look, I was saying, I'm, I'm a, 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 I try to be positive, let's say it this way, because look, we, uh, look, the United States, in my opinion, is the world leader in innovation in, in getting stuff done. Look, if we make a decision to put a man on the moon, we put a man on the moon. If we make this decision to decarbonize our economy, we, we can do that. So there is a lot of technology we'll have. There's still a lot, a lot of technology we have to innovate. Uh, we need to go faster on the scalability. The key is, and this is my kind of biggest concern is, are we sticking to the plan? Because a lot of this, as you all know, is also a, a political uh, uh, issue. So if we would continue to see a change where we say, we're going off it, we're stopping it, we're going off it, we're stopping it, then I would get nervous. Because when you look at this, when you map out the way towards 2050, when I said again, we have not too much time left. So we hopefully will have the continue, continue that we stick to this and really systematically start to implement this. This is not done overnight. So look, this is why some people say, well, well, you might have new perovskite cells in five years. Why are we not waiting to, before we put solar into the market? No, we need to deploy current technology. We have to innovate the next generation of technologies. We need to do this in a parallel approach. We need, there's a lot of room still for us to go to deeper penetration before a lot of new grid architecture has to happen. So right now you have saw this, we let's say 20 plus percent. We easily can do 50, 60, 70% without major kind of changes in our grid architecture. We have to change a little bit, but I think it's doable. So, but the key is we need to go and deploy technology and innovate the next generation. Then we have to do this parallel to make the 2050 happen. So we're, we, I have, we have time for just one more question. And I will tell you, there are a lot of great questions that are coming. It's very hard to pick between them. So um, I'm gonna make a comment and answer one of the questions really quickly. So someone is, wants to know, how do, we, how do they get a new idea in front of uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory? To which my initial answer before I let you answer is there are now 26 challenges through the American made prizes, the American made challenges um, that any innovator across uh, the United States can submit. So you can find one for perovskite, you can find one for geothermal manufacturing. So I would encourage any new ideas to go through 
that channel, which is an incredibly successful way of accelerating technologies. Do you have anything to add to that? How would someone bring a new technology to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory? So I tell you, I'm the biggest, biggest, you know, fan for kind of collaborations. Look, if there is, and look, and as you know, we we are starting to have much more collaboration with different universities across all the <clears throat> all the US, but also on, 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 on international level. And the reason is exactly because of this. Look, I think that we need to do a better job in to reach out, build a network with good ideas. There's a platform where people can go and, and say, hey, what about this? And you can write some proposals together. You can team up on this one. So if you have some ideas and depending on, uh, just reach out to us. Let's see, is there a way to collaborate? There is through the kind of the Biden administration, as you probably all follow this, uh, there is potentially a lot of funds going into this way of innovating in the energy space. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunities to create new ideas, to see how we can scale some of these ideas, how, how we can work together. And I would also encourage you, because I always loved interaction from, from staff to staff. That's always the most exciting ones. Look, we have done this very successful now with Georgia Tech. We have joint appointments with Georgia Tech. We have done this, of course, with, with, with UC Boulder. We've done this with Mines. We've done this now with also Imperial College in London. So there's a lot of opportunities to do this. I know there's a lot of touch points already with, uh, with your organization. So mm -hmm. if you have good ideas, just reach out to us and then let's have a discussion how, how we could further develop this ideas. So before we get to your final comment, which I just want to, you know, what is your big idea, the thing that you want for all of us to be thinking about? Um, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to blend two together um, because we've got questions about blockchain and questions about different technologies, et cetera. So what policy options would be most helpful to spur rapid deployment of, the, of technologies? And do you see carbon pricing, either a tax or a cap and trade system necessary to incentivize? So those two are sort of linked. Should yeah. it be policy or is it incentives? Or is there, what was yes. your point of view? And then we'd love yes. to hear your last word. It is both. I think, look, uh, again, I always try as a scientist, uh, I try to stay away from policy. And again, as we know, what we always be trying to inform policy. Mm -hmm. But look, the, the key is, I think we need, we need, all of the above. So look, we need incentives. We need to make the transition. We, I think sooner or later, I don't know that, that, uh, that uh, uh, without a, a, car a carbon tax or whatever you call it, and look, I'm, I'm not a policy person, so what the right vehicle is, but I think, I think we, we need to be, you know, we need to develop a system, but honestly, the key is it has to be also on the international level. And this is why it will be interesting as you probably saw all the issues that COP and who is coming and who is falling behind on their new pledges and updating them. Because I think I think hopefully sooner or later, we as a, as a planet, we realize that we're all in this together. I always say a CO2 molecule doesn't stop on our borders. So what India or China is emitting is also impacting us and vice versa. So I hope that sooner or later the globe will work on this together to get a hand on this one because we all we only have one planet and look we cannot just go and go to the neighboring planet that's not possible at least right now so this means we are stuck on this planet so we better work together so uh, perhaps let me finish with saying a big thank you to all of you and again this is to all of you and uh, um, from from there especially the students and postdocs who are listening in there uh, thank you for all what you're doing I'm counting on you you're the generation who will fix that so we need you. So keep on doing what you're doing. Don't give up. Look, I'm seeing this when I talk to a lot of our students and postdocs and also through some other events. My optimism, and I just gave this public radio interview not long ago, and then the, 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 the person asked me, Martin, you sound very optimistic. I said, yes, I am. Because of this is you generation. Because I'm seeing this uh, in Reliance who are coming to us because they want to change the planet. They want to do something which has, is impactful. They don't, just don't want to do, of course, they want to do great science, but they want to do science to impact our planet, to create a better planet. And this honestly makes me optimistic because I know that together you will be the generation who will figure this out. You will be the scientists and engineers who will get the technology in the marketplace. So don't give up. Push as hard as you can because we need you. Without you, uh, we all doomed. So we need all of you to continue <laughs> to drive this. So thank you for all what you're doing and keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up.
Thank you. So the you said the Inrelians. I really like that. Uh, yeah. It's good to see all the Inrelians also doing a lot of great work. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your talk today. This will be made available on our website, so you will be able to find this link. In fact, everyone who is registered today should be getting uh, a hyperlink to this. It'll take us a couple of days to get it to you. Several of you have asked if these slides will be available. Th this video will be available. Um, please join us on November 2nd. That is our next session um, with Richard Vorburg from Siemens Energy. So hoping that you can join us next week. Um, but until then, Martin, uh, Dr. Keller, thank you again for a very insightful dialogue. Um, so many questions. I wish we could have gotten to more of them. And I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for all yeah. that you're doing uh, to uh, move us to the next level. Thank you. Thank and you so that, much. Yep, have a great that, afternoon. Sign off. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much, everyone.